to them about them, not at them about you. So I'll say that again. So 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 the trick, or well, it's not a, it's not a, I got it. The word trick actually, that's not even fair to say. We, we talk to them about them. We don't talk at them about you. To meet people and they'd be great, and I'd be like, oh my god, they're doing everything right. Like, <laughs> but they didn't necessarily know what they were doing right. So we were just identifying so they could repeat. And that was one of the things that came up a lot in 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 the years and the training I was doing with people. Um, they were talking at the audience kind of about themselves. And, and it goes back to that point about I'm going to give you all of my data. And I'm going to let you figure out what to do with it. And, and that's really where this audience focus presenting versus um, presenter focused presenting. So a very good presenter does all of the work for you. And if I could take it back to an even simpler example, and I, I hope you have one of these, I think we all do. If you go back to school and we had many, many teachers and we were learning, you know, not very sexy stuff. Well, maybe like geography and history. And, and there was always one, one teacher. In my case, it was he used to teach business, uh, commerce and business, accounting and business. It was not a sexy subject at all, um, but he brought it to life. He, he just brought it to life. And Welcome to the Ideas on Stage podcast, your regular insight into leadership communication. Hi, Emma. Welcome to the show. Hi, Andrea. I'm so, so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. As we were talking about it offline, it's, I'm super excited about this conversation. It's great to have this opportunity because I invited you on the podcast when was it last year two years ago uh, but then we couldn't for some reason we couldn't do it so thank you very much for your time and uh, i'm looking forward to this conversation me too delighted we could make it work yeah um just out of curiosity emma you are you are you live in ireland right yes i do in dublin in ireland dublin yeah so i lived in ireland many years ago just for a year i spent one i was a student at the time at university i spent one year in sligo on the west coast small town but i loved it i've got a if you want an emotional connection to ireland because it was my very first experience abroad and uh, i loved it uh, well, sligo is is a beautiful place and i do know it i went through a stage a little while ago, I don't know if you did this in your year, but uh, I took up surfing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. And it is a wonderful place to surf. And it has a an amazing culture, obviously, being right beside the sea and a beautiful sort of seaside culture. And I took up surfing. Now, in Ireland, that means you're head to toe in neoprene, um, whether that's in July or December. And I did do it in December. <laughs> Although I did discover very quickly that surfing is not what I thought. It's a huge amount of work to kind of get out to the wave just for a couple of seconds to get back in. So, <laughs> but did you partake of some surfing? I, in I tried uh, yeah. and you're right. I think Sligo is a great place if you surf. If you don't surf, it is windy and wet, I have to say. But <laughs> if, even if you don't surf, it's 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 amazing. And, and in my case, especially during the academic year, I think there are maybe 20,000 people that were we're talking about maybe 15 years ago, 20,000 people living in Sligo, 15,000 during the academic year are students. So it's fun. It was very fun. <laughs> All right. So now today, Emma, I, I would like to talk about your your book, one of your books, the, the presentation book, which is great. I recommend it. But before we get there, in preparation for this conversation, I, I saw that you also wrote other books. And in particular, you wrote some books for kids as well. Like I've got here, uh, My Dad is My Hero. And that resonated with me because I'm I'm a father since just a few months. So My Dad is My Hero is something that I need to check out. There's also another one about, if I'm not wrong, diversity and inclusion for kids. Can you tell us just a little bit more about uh, th those books as well? Sure. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Hope you're getting some sleep. Possibly not. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess 
and, and it started with the presentation book, which was uh, 2013, so 10 years ago, actually 2011, oh, so um, 12 years ago. And um, I, ha I have a background in media and a background in front of the camera, and then I went into business. And through that, I, I really discovered my love of writing. And um, I had produced, I had presented, I had done lots of other things, but I just discovered a, a huge passion for writing in writing the presentation book. It was just of everything I've ever done in my life. It just felt most like I was at home writing. So basically for the last 12 years, I, I have been trying to write as, as much as I can in, in lots of different ways. And I have folders on my computer and I have a poetry book in the works. I'm not sure that will ever come to the light of day, but um, and then I myself had my children. So my children are four and six. And um, and I was immersed, um, as you do when you become a parent in that in that world. And reading is very important to me and books are very important to me. And I read something about I have two boys and I read a very interesting um, sort of statistic about boys that they read till the age of 12 and then they put down a book and they never pick them up again. Now, that's obviously incredibly general. I'm not saying that applies to every boy and man out there. But I felt it was very important for me to try and make sure books and a love of books and reading uh, was in my house. So in that, I started to read all these children's books with my children. And um, I just got very inspired. And I was very much in that um, I was on maternity leave. I took some family leave. Um, so I was away from the corporate world completely. And um, I just got this inspiration to 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 want to write um, a, a children's book and then two and then three. And I, I probably have, I have a couple of others in the, in the pipeline. And um, it's been a very different experience, Andrea, because with my business books, I very formally published them with the wonderful Pearson Publishing in the UK, who I loved working with. And that was an incredible experience. But with my children's books, I made the decision to self-publish, which is interesting and, and is a very different route to go down. So not only did I write the books, but the whole production piece was behind them. And I, I loved doing that. And um I go into schools now and read them and they're connecting with people in a completely different way to the presentation book, obviously, or the communication book. But yes, I have my mommy knows everything, which I guess is just about that moment in time when a child is three or four, when the mommy knows the favorite cup, the favorite toy, the favorite pajamas, you know, my daddy is my hero. So as I said, I have two boys who idolize their, their daddy and um, daddies are so important. They're so important. Um, so yeah, I felt I felt the daddies deserved a book as well. Thank you. Um, no, thank you. And, and, yeah. and the other one was all the rainbow scholars, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a very interesting one because um, and again, this was quite shocking to me. Um, my two little boys are in a crash or Montessori. I know, I know it's called different things in different countries, but sort of preschool. And I discovered around the age of three or four, uh, it's probably around four. Um, before that, my kids never talked about difference, girls, boys, uh, glasses, no glasses, color of their skin. It just was never talked about. And then suddenly at, at age four and me and the other parents were talking and, you know, one of the little girls got glasses and um, one of the other boys got these really fancy runners. And suddenly there was uh, the only way I can describe it is it was it was bullying and and and. You could call it baby bullying, but, you know, they were really starting to notice difference in each other and they were starting to point it out. And and many kids, including my own, sometimes were coming home crying because, you know, something wasn't up to whatever it needed to be. So I suppose I wrote that book and also in my business world, diversity, such a huge topic. You, you know that it's everywhere now and we're all learning and unlearning every day about that topic. You know, I have so much to learn. I make so many mistakes. You know, I go back and forth. And I suppose I wanted to write a book for, for my children and for that age group just to talk about, I mean, fundamentally, it's it's kindness. You know, it's fundamentally we're, we're different, but we're the same. 
on the outside we look different on the inside we're the same and it's just to start that conversation at a very young age where where I felt and I saw it happening at four like at three everyone was best friends and at four like my my son was like I don't like girls and I was I was I couldn't believe it I, and it wasn't coming from anywhere you know we weren't doing it I know the teachers in school in Montessori were wonderful. It was just happening very organically. So that book for me is very important in, in that way. And I think resonates. It, it's a different book to the mommy and daddy book. Yeah, for sure. I found it, I found it interesting because it, as you said, yes, everybody talks about for the right reasons, diversity and inclusion. But then I, I think I had never seen that topic explained and written about for kids and so yeah very interesting well done and, and now emma going back to the main theme of of our podcast communication presentations so you wrote this book the presentation book and now you you said that you come from you've got you have a background in media so you've worked as a vj for mtv as a tv presenter for B, for the bbc radio host so it might be a very general question, but just out of curiosity, can you pick any, are there any lessons? It could be one, just one thing that comes to mind or a few things. Presentation lessons for you coming from that background. Uh, yeah, so, oh my God, how long have you got? But I'll try and, <laughs> so um, I was 17 years of age when I started working in media and it's it's very different to business. You know, media is the business of, of presenting and ratings. Um, and I was in that world for 10, 15 years before I, I stepped into business. And what shocked me, really, really shocked me when I moved into business was I kept meeting all these extraordinary individuals, um, educated, uh, technically superb, very, very, very passionate and compassionate in their roles as leaders, in their jobs. They had to present a huge amount as part of their jobs. I'm talking about lawyers, accountants, engineers, uh, entrepreneurs, and no one had ever taught them how to do this. Not really. And there was a huge amount of, or, or certainly there was many what I would call myths so, and I guess the biggest, the biggest one, which used to shock me the most was, I really found people believed this was something you just, you know, stood up and did. <laughs> and I was like, what? I mean, if you had any idea, the, the amount of production direction and preparation that went into television, radio and live TV. And I, I guess that was a place I was coming from. I mean, I would have done quite a lot of of live television, you know, three hours of live television. And it was days and days and days of preparation. And I mean, we prepared how we sat, prepared what we said, <laughs> prepared interactions. We prepared how we walked from one side of the studio to the other. And I'm not saying there wasn't sort of impromptu moments. So of course there were, but it was within this incredibly prepared space. And I, I was very shocked that, that um, in the world of business that didn't have this insight, that there really was this belief that, um, you know, people just stood up and did this. And, and that's just not the reality. And I guess that was the biggest thing when I started transitioning, because initially I, I really wondered what I even had to offer these extraordinary individuals. You know, I was like, well, I don't have an MBA and I'm not some incredible engineer and, and I have no idea what they're talking about in terms of A, B and C. But when I started to talk to these men and women, um, they had all this data and the data was important and they had all of these things they needed to communicate and they were genuinely struggling to communicate it because no one had ever told them or because everybody was following this sort of... Uh, I suppose, death by PowerPoint model. And it's, it's changing and it's changing slowly. But but ultimately, you know, in a lot of cases, that's that's all they had were these slides. And, and, and then the other big challenge that I think a lot of business people have, even still today, is 
the presentation is also for the people that's not in the room. That's also the handout. That's also the, so you have this, um, what I would describe as a, as a document that's kind of then turned into all these other forms of communication. And, and again, that's achieving nothing or but certainly not achieving a, an effective presentation. So yeah, that, that was the biggest um, difference that I saw was in media, the amount of background work that goes into what you see on TV is very polished. And it is very polished. But the team of people and the amount of hours that go into that would would absolutely astound you, you know, and and so equally, I try to take those principles and bring them into the business presentation and work with leaders and business people. And in your book, you, you do talk about the importance of, which is connected to, it's not the only thing, but it's connected to these. You do talk about the importance of rehearsing. We'll, we'll yeah. get there. And, but before that, you, you also, I think it's either in the book or somewhere online, I heard you mention an example, which I would love for you to share, Emma, which is something that happened to the Space Shuttle Columbia and NASA in 2003, an incident which killed all the astronauts on board and you say oh maybe it's not you i guess that that incident was attributed to poor communication can you for the benefit of our audience can you tell us what happened there and why it's connected to bad communication yeah so it's it's a very very it's a real story and it's a very very sad story and um it's a story I tell at the beginning of the presentation book, and I'll tell you in a second, I guess, why I, I, I tell that story. Um, so basically in 2003, the space shuttle Columbia uh, was launched from Kennedy Space Station, and there were seven astronauts on board. And um, as many of your listeners may have seen on TV or maybe even in person, I don't know anyone who's ever seen a shuttle launch in person, but certainly when I've watched it on TV, when a shuttle is is launching, it's kind of released. And it, as it flies off, if, if you watch the screen, there tends to be quite a lot of debris that flies around. So for this particular shuttle launch, um, the shuttle was released, the debris flew around. That That's very normal. That happens all of the time. Um, they call that a foam strike when the debris hits off the shuttle, but normally there's no damage. Um, but in this particular case with the Space Shuttle Columbia, uh, the next day, the Space Shuttle Columbia was in, it was in space. And the engineers that were kind of looking back over the launch and checking all the data realized that the particular foam strike that happened in January 2003 to the Space Shuttle Columbia was bigger and faster than anything they had ever seen before. And they believed basically the shuttle now had a hole in the heat shield, but they weren't sure. So what these engineers in NASA needed to do was convince uh, senior managers in NASA. So if you can imagine the engineers are here and the senior managers are up here and it was a very hierarchical organization and they needed a satellite photograph. Now these are very, very, very expensive things to ask for and to get and they need to be warranted. So they kind of made a few phone calls to senior managers and said, look, we need this photo. We're a little bit concerned. And uh, the senior managers said, yeah, I don't really get this. You know, foam strikes happen all the time. What's the big deal? And they said, look, come and come and tell us what the problem is. So the senior managers said to the engineers, you know, come and tell us what is the big deal here? Because this kind of happens all the time, you know. So what the engineers did was, uh, because they were going to speak to senior managers and they wanted to be seen as intelligent, informed, they wanted to be seen as having all the data, you know, and they were talking to people very, very senior, fellow engineers. They put together a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation. It was um, 12, 13 slides long. And the key point was on that very last slide, the second last sentence. So they basically spent kind of 11 and a half slides, um, what I would call qualifying before they state. So they talked about foam strikes that had happened in the past and they talked about foam strikes that hadn't happened and they talked about the danger of foam strikes. And then in the very last slide and the second last line, they basically said in engineering terms, uh, this foam strike is unlike anything we've ever seen. But no, they didn't say that. I'm saying that to you so you understand. They, they didn't say it that clearly. 
But again, these were engineers talking to other engineers. There was an assumption. And that's a, that's a big word. And that's quite important, you know, to, to sort of take on board. There was an assumption. They will get this. So this presentation was all about trying to get a photograph, a satellite photograph. The senior managers watched the presentation. They took it away. They read it possibly. And they came back and they said, no, uh, it's not warranted. We don't need it. It's no big deal. This happens all the time. Everything's fine. And a couple of days later, the Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated as it was re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. What they later discovered was the foam strike, the piece of debris that hit the shuttle was the size of a suitcase. And it did cause a six to 10 inch hole in the heat shield of the shuttle, as the engineers had suspected. So there was a huge investigation afterwards. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board was set up to see what happened. Now, look, it obviously wasn't just this one presentation. There was a cultural issue within NASA as well that was addressed. But the Accident Investigation Board looked at this particular presentation and these particular slides. And they basically said the key message was lost in all of the data. And had these engineers just walked in the door, sort of slammed their fists on the table and went, seven people are going to die if we don't get this photo, you know, the message might have gotten across. So it's a very powerful story because, again, I, you know, I can't walk into to anyone, to any leader. I can't walk into any leader or any group of leaders and go, hey, you're doing it wrong. I mean, you know, who's going to respond to that? And also, you don't know what you don't know, you know, and what's very powerful about that story, and it's a very special story, and um, I'm very lucky to find a story to very much match what I'm trying to say. Um, when you tell people that story, they see it, and they feel it, and they get it. And if they are presenting that way, you know, if they are experts who are loading their presentations with huge amount of data, if they're making assumptions about the listener, that they're they're getting this or that they're going to listen. I mean, did the senior managers listen for 12 slides? You know, I'm going to argue they didn't, you know, because who's going to? Who's going to listen to 11 slides of background, you know? And yet that's where so many of us begin with our presenting. So it's a very powerful story to start the conversation with business leaders and presenters where you say, look, possibly the way you have been doing this is not as effective as you may think it is. And, so and it does yeah. it does highlight the, the, the point that a presentation is so much more than just PowerPoint. And, and when I say PowerPoint, I'm not talking about the presentation tool. I'm talking about the idea that a presentation is so much more than just putting together some slides. Uh, if you do it well, if you present your idea as well, if you communicate your idea as well, then you have an opportunity to make an impact, to achieve your objective. If you don't do it well, then the opposite happens. Okay, so thanks for sharing that. Now, you also mentioned already, as you were sharing this example, that what they did, for example they included the key point to at the very end of the presentation. Now, in your book, you give this tip. You say, lead with your strongest point. Whereas what most people do is they structure their presentations as they did with a bit of background, or maybe they start by introducing themselves, or they start with a boring agenda slide. Whereas you say, lead with your strongest point. Can you tell us if, if there is anything else that you'd like to add from this perspective? Can, can we unpack this in a little bit more detail? Yeah, of course. Um, so, so this goes back to fundamentally uh, why people listen and how long people listen for. So when it comes to um, getting people to listen to you, any of us, you know, for any length of time, for a podcast, for anything, for a pre uh, presentation, for anything, uh, if you think about radio, if you think about TV, we engage with something, um, any of us, for one of three reasons. So um, we will listen if we are genuinely interested. So people do listen out of interest. So, so when people go, oh, people will just listen to me because they're interested. Possibly. Um, absolutely possibly. 
I guess the only thing when it comes to relying on interest is you don't know how long you have that for. So, I mean, even if you look at something as simple as, um, and I'm so, I'm so guilty of this at the moment, you know, I'm, I'm half watching Netflix, I'm half on my phone, I'm half talking to my husband, you know, I, I'm doing nothing. I'm doing, you know. so do you have my interest? I'm not, I'm not sure you do Netflix. I'm not sure you, do, you know, so, so interest is, it's one of those things. It's, it's very hard to know a, if you have it and B it's very hard to know how long you have it for. So there are two other reasons why people will, will listen to you. And one is if they're going to gain and one is if they're going to lose or there is a fear. And, and I've listened to some of your other podcasts, Andrea, and I, I know some of your other um, guests have talked about this, the kind of leading with fear or the, you know, especially if, if you're talking about something, um, I don't know, global warming or this type of thing, people will lead with it with a fear. Now, it doesn't always work, but for some people, it may be a reason for them to listen. Or you can tell people what they're going to gain. So in my case, when I talk about presenting, you know, I always try to talk about, look, let's make the next presentation the best you do. Let's let's grow your brand with your presenting. Let's get you that job with your presenting. Let's really inspire your team with that presenting. So let's engage with this because you will you will gain. And um, I suppose what I say to people that I work with is because you cannot rely on interest and you've no idea if you even really have it, you need to look at that sort of gain or loss hook. And I call it a hook because what you want to do at the beginning of your presentation, very simply, is give your audience a reason to listen. And the reason to listen is they're going to gain by listening or if, if they don't listen, you know, they're going to lose out in some way or there is a fear in some way. Now, that's a very broad principle. And I think it's really important to say, you know, depending on the speaker, the context, the content, that can be worked and shaped and used in very different ways. Equally, when I say bring your strongest message up front, like with Colombia, you know, you can go in and say seven people are going to die. <laughs> now, that is very stark and you need to be able to back that up. You know, or you could just go in a little bit more gently and, and sort of say, today I'm going to tell you about X, Y, Z, you know, because if I don't, we're going to lose a load of business. Or So I'm not saying you always have to give your key point away. And some people are very concerned about, they're like, oh, I don't want to do the big reveal straight away. And, and you don't have to do the big reveal straight away. Of course not. But you need to let them know the big reveal is coming and you need to let them know why they should keep listening for the big reveal. Um, and again, that's about, you know, content crafting and, and there is no one size fits all. But what I would say with and this is no exaggeration with every single person I've ever worked with. We literally end up flipping their presentation. You know, they come to me with a presentation and, and, and without doubt, they get to the end and they go in summary. <laughs> so what I'm really trying to say is and, and they'll say it. So what the big takeaway from today is and there it'll be. And you're like, ah, that's it. So we need to maybe bring that forward to the beginning and either and either say it that literally or just find. And it, but if they want to tease it a little bit more, it's it's finding a way to say it without saying it so that they hook in. They get that audience hooked in so they go, whoa, this is worth my time. And they do need to do that very quickly. So the research says, you know, you've got 45 seconds max and, and that's changing all the time now. That I mean, I read recently that's down to 10 seconds you know, with the way our attention span is, is going. So you need to do it quick. Now, you do need to back up your point. You can't just stand up and make this startling hook. And it doesn't have to be startling. Again, it's not all about bells and whistles. It could be just as simple as, you know, we need to talk about this today because if we don't, you know, we're, we're going to lose out here. You know, um, you then have to back it up and you have to bring all your data points in, but you must keep linking them back to the hook. And that's the other really important point, Andrea. You know, you don't just have this strong hook and then go into all the data because you're going to lose them again. You must keep with every data point you bring in. Hook back. So if we go back to the Space Shuttle Columbia, if they had gone in and said, we have never seen a, a foam strike like this before, and we believe the seven astronauts are in danger. And then they go into, I don't know, the history of foam strikes. And they talk about one that happened five years before. They would then need to say, so that foam strike then was this size. We believe this foam strike today is three times bigger. 
So it's it's always linking back, linking back, linking back. So you are re-hooking and re-engaging that audience. And we see that in media all the time. And if you watch TV, if you listen to the radio, they will sort of say coming up in the next hour and they'll tell you it's this and that, but, but they don't tell you what time it's at. They don't, you know, they, they tell you in a way that you have to listen. And, and TV does the same. They, they begin an episode of, of a show with um, a hook that you go, oh my God. And then you have to watch the show, you know, to sort of figure out what's going on. So that's what a hook is. And as I said, it's not a one size fits all. It does not have to be a big dramatic, crazy thing. It really doesn't. It can just be a very thoughtful, engaging, meeting the audience where they are, you know, but it's just so important to do it. You want to capture the audience's attention. You want to make them want to listen. And Emma, you also mentioned something else during the, the NASA story. You said that not only did they, the engineers wait until the very end to get that key point across, but they also communicated it in engineering terms. And in that case, there were engineers talking to sort of engineers. But often it's even worse because we have engineers or technical people talking to non-engineers or non-technical people who don't have the same level of understanding or knowledge about the subject. And, and you do talk about these obstacles that you see in communication. Emma, I, we are very much aligned. I see all the time with our clients as well. We, we often use, most presenters, whether they are aware of it or not, use industry terminology, acronyms, language in general that they understand, not, not necessarily the audience. Can you tell us more about why this often is an obstacle to good communication? Yeah, so such a great question. So I think, again, it's very important to, to acknowledge that we all have a language in business, you know, whether it's sales or marketing or engineering or law or accounting or academia, you know, there is a language to, to everything. There's a language to learning and development. There's a language to coaching. So, so we all have a language. And um, I, I think there's always an assumption that when you're talking to someone that is, a, that is a peer, that there is an understanding. And again, possibly to a point there is. Um, but I suppose if you want to be sure that you are communicating effectively, it's very important that you use something called first degree words. And they are words that only have one meaning. And again, it's plain English, it's layman's terms. Um, and, and I know people can struggle with this. And, and I, it's funny, and I, again, I really don't want to generalize or certainly insult anybody, but in my experience of training and, and working with business people, I have found academics, engineers, solicitors, lawyers, there are certain um, fields where they struggle to use more simple language because because they believe it's it's baby talk and, and, and they're not trying to be condescending and saying that but you know these individuals have spent years and years and years studying to get to a certain level they are senior managers directors vps and then you say to them look can, can you just say it in plain english and they're like what <laughs> what do you mean um and and again it can be a barrier because people really believe that they're being understood. But what's interesting, and again, I, I again, time and time again, I in my own work with individuals and teams, I have done an exercise where we've used acronyms and jargon, and we've asked around the room how everybody understands that. And it's astonishing in a room full of, of equals. You know, a technical term is understood in completely different ways. Or an acronym, you know, is it a DIE or a DEI or a DOE? Or, and, and the problem with that language is what it forces people to do, especially acronyms, is it stops the flow of them listening to you. So, so they're listening to you and then you bring up an acronym. And, and if they don't get it straight away, they may, they may not. But if, if they're not on exactly the same page as you, they're going to have to stop. And they're going to have to go. Is that the, hang on a minute now, which one is that? And you've lost them. You've lost them. And even if they come back to your presentation, which they may or they may not, you're gone ahead. They, they, you've lost them. 
and they may not come back to your presentation at all. So I, I use an analogy of presentations being like a travelator, you know, the flat escalators. Um, you're on it as a speaker. You're on this travelator and you are moving and you want to keep an audience with you. And what you don't want to do is for them to step off. And technical language and acronyms and second and third degree words that simply have other meanings can force an audience to kind of go into their head to try and process it. So, you know, if you want to be a very, very effective presenter and communicator, using first degree words is the way to do that. And not baby talk, not patronizing. And I think you only have to watch some of the phenomenal TED talks out there you know, some of the world's leading experts on topics, you know, and they're telling stories and they're using very simple language to explain something very complex, which is effectively what communication is. It's creating understanding. But that can be a barrier. And again, people are afraid that they won't look intelligent or they're afraid that they won't look like they're doing their job properly or they are afraid of being judged by their peers. And that's completely understandable and that's part of the journey for some people when it comes to presenting for them to realize that possibly they're not as understood as they believe they are even among their peers and that maybe they have to start breaking it down and, and do you know something sometimes they can't explain it themselves straight away and they have to kind of go back and go hang on a minute I'm struggling <laughs> to understand it that's why I can't explain it to someone else so it's a it's a journey some presenters have to go on. Or maybe they find it hard to explain it simply, not because they struggle to understand it, but for the opposite reason, because they know so much about it, they're so close to the subject that they take it for granted. That So these two things are very much connected, that what they say is understood by, by the audience. Uh, a few, a couple of months ago, maybe, no, uh, towards the end of last year, I we've done an event together with you may know Carmine Gallo the author of Talk Like Ted and a few other best-selling yes. books and I've also interviewed him for this podcast and the last book he published is The Bezos Blueprint and he talks about the communication principles from Amazon from Jeff Bezos and he talks a lot about this idea of using simple language so it's a book that I recommend and you're right, Emma, it's not about oversimplifying your your subject, your ideas. It's about finding and using language that as many people as possible in the audience can, can understand. So we want to do it for them. Uh, you've also touched a little bit on, on a connected obstacle to communication that you see you that you say you see with your clients, uh, and, and I see exactly the same thing, which is that most presenters, again, whether they they are aware of it or not, they struggle to get out of their own detail. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, so I, I think the one thing none of us are short of nowadays is data. And it's very, very important. I, I you know, data is everything. It's everything. Um and and it's great that we're using it and we're talking about it and we're backing things up. But we've so much of it and um, people have so much that they want to say. So I don't know if you're the same one. And when I meet people, they have so much they want to talk about. They want to talk about everything. You know, whether that's a salesperson that wants to talk all about their company before they talk about, you know, whether that's someone that has done years and years of research and they're now presenting their findings and they're like, no, but I have to talk about everything that led me to this point. And so I think sometimes um, what a brilliant presenter does is they they decide what to talk about, but equally they decide what not to talk about. And I think, again, that's a really, really important decision that needs to be made as part of the preparation process. And, and that's why I'm saying none of this is straightforward and none of this can be just I'm standing up off the cuff and, and talking because all of that is 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 part of your preparation. I would say 90% of the success of your presentation is determined way before you speak. So not only do you have to figure out how do I make my data understandable, you also have to figure out, well, what do I not talk about here? Because the simple truth is, and the simple fact is, you can't talk about everything. Like you can't. Even if you think you want to, 
you can't be, because nobody is able to take that amount of information in. And again, there is studies that show we can only take a certain amount of information in. And, and I talk about this and this is this is not again, I can't take any credit for this as such. Um, it's a principle called the rule of three. It's probably in every, every presentation book out there, every communication book out there that um, we we can remember three key things. And, and a very simple way it was explained to me a long time ago was, you know, if someone asks you to go to the shop, get me bread, get me milk, get me bacon. Once they go on to number four, you know, get me the newspaper, you're going to forget number one, you know, uh, even if you're really smart. You're Emma, still, Emma, still going to go, oh. Emma, sorry, on this point. Yeah. I've got here because yesterday my wife asked me to to go to 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 do to to get something on in the supermarket and uh, I've got a list here of uh, maybe you can't say it because it was from I yesterday see. I didn't have my phone it was charging so I wrote it down and I had to write three things even three things I had to write them because otherwise I was afraid I would forget them. That's it. So and I thought, I'm like, two two courgettes, four fennels, and lettuce. So these, this is what I had to remember, but I had to write it down. Yes. But that's what I mean. No, but and, and like I said, it's nothing to do with your intelligence or it's our brains. You know, it's it's how much we can take in. And, and I mean, I'm not sure any of us even take away three key messages, but this rule of, of three is a very important communication principle. And as I said, um, you know, this one size fits all. I, I, I It's very important to look at your own circumstance and your own presentation but it's about taking your data. Well, first of all, the audience will determine so much of what you are and aren't going to talk about. So you probably have this, I always call it your, your, your bag of data. You have this amazing bag of data. And depending on the audience, you're going to take out the pieces that are relevant and you're going to keep the others in there for a different audience. You know, so even if, if I take myself around presenting, you know, if I'm talking to a group of graduates, I'm going to talk about probably a lot more about nerves. I'm going to talk a lot more about hand gestures and that type of thing. If I'm talking to your audience, Andrea, we're, we're, we're getting into data and we're getting into acronyms and we're getting into, it's much more sophisticated. It doesn't mean I can't, you know, talk all about nerves, but that may not be the focus for today. So you have your bag of data, your, your bag of amazing information, your, your grab bag, and depending on your audience, you, you take out your data, but not only that, you, you have to structure it so that you're not just throwing the data at them in all random ways. You know, you, you figure out how to, to give that to them in the most digestible, easy, understandable, uh, and may I even say enjoyable way possible. It does not have to be torture, you know. Um, but yes, I, I think it's so important to recognize that you cannot talk about everything and actually the thing you might think is really 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 important may actually not be that important to this audience right now and the other thing I just want to mention and it's in the book and again Andrea I don't know if you do this as well is the idea of in any audience you're going to have what I call the converted the floater and the unconvertible so something that I see happen in a huge amount is people presenting to what I would call the converted. So the converted are the people that happen to be in the room during the presentation that already have your message. So that could be your boss. <laughs> that could be the other people on the team. That could be, I don't know, if you're making a sales presentation um, and you're pitching to five people, there might be two people on that panel that you know, you've know you already sold. They think you're great and they brought you in to meet the other three. Um, and a lot of times people will create a presentation for the converted so it's nearly a look how great we are presentation but the actual the floaters so these are the people that are willing to be converted but they have questions so they are willing but they have questions and your job as a presenter is to figure out what those questions are and then the purpose of your presentation is to answer them so you convert them but you need to, if you don't know what those questions are and you don't answer them, you're never going to convert them. And then equally, you can have the unconvertible. And sometimes I see people focus too much on these guys. So, look, there's not millions of these um, listeners out there. Sometimes they're unconvertible for very good reasons. They don't have the money. They don't have the budget. Maybe they've had a negative experience. Maybe they're just not in the headspace where they're they're able to engage right now. 
Um, but no matter what you do, no matter what you say, you can be the best presenter in the world. Yeah, they're not going to convert. They're unconvertible. Why are they in the room? Maybe someone told them they had to be. <laughs> I'm not sure. But I, again, it's all of that has to be taken into account. And then you decide, is this the right information to give here? You started talking about them, the audience, uh, which is the key of 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 your book also. And, and again, Emma, we are a hundred percent aligned in the in your approach. In the book, you talk about you describe your approach as the or, or the approach that you suggest as the audience focused presenting approach, which is which is all about the audience. Is there anything else that you would like to to add here? If we think about the the importance of of thinking about the audience in preparation for any presentation and and tailoring a message to a specific audience, yeah, it's it's everything because uh, again, everything that we're talking about here, you and you and I today, you know, from the language you use, from the stories, from the examples, from what data do you even choose from your wonderful bag of data that you have um, to, to what do you want to achieve? What is the purpose? Every single one of those questions is answered when you know who you're talking to. Um, and I suppose the, the good news most of the time, and again, I, I, I really don't like making major generalizations because I know it's not always that straightforward, but most of the time you have some insight into who you're speaking to as a, a business person. So are you pitching for funding? Are you speaking to your team? Are you speaking to the whole business? Are you speaking to the sales team, the marketing team, the ops team? Is it good news? Is it bad news? Is it a change? Um, you know, are you trying to get people on board? Are you trying to get people to do something? Are you moving from one IT system to another? I mean, normally you have some sense of who you're talking to and, and certainly what the goal of the presentation is, just, just by the brief, you know? So what I would say is, again, overconfidence and arrogance, and I, I don't like that word, but it's the only word I know to describe um, sort of a position where people will say, oh, I know, I know, I know. I know what the audience want. I know what they need. I know where they're at. Again, that can be very crippling. You know, I say to people all the time, go and ask. You go and ask. I mean, even today, um, Andrea, ahead of today, I emailed and I said, you know, can you tell me what I need to prepare? Can you tell me the type of questions you're going to ask? Because, again, I was trying to get my my grab bag ready, you know, and um, but because, again, I, I don't I, I can I can think I know where you're coming from, but, but I don't really unless I ask. And and again, I know you can't always ask. Um, but where you can, where you can connect and sort of say, look, I'm coming in to give this presentation. Can I ask what are the top three questions you'd like answered? Can I ask where you're at? Um, and you can do that. I mean, I've worked with people who've literally emailed the people they're going to, to talk to and say, look, I just want to confirm who's going to be in the room. Um, what areas would you like us to cover? Or I'm thinking of covering ABC. Am I missing something? And again, I know it it probably requires a little bit of thought about how to do that. If you're unable to do that, and I appreciate you may not be able to always ask directly to the audience, you may be able to get some insight from maybe somebody else in the business, may have experience with them, have similar experience. Or indeed, you can go in at the beginning of the presentation and say, you know, we haven't had a chance to talk about what your needs are. Um, based on what I know, I'm going to go with this, but I want you to know that you know, if I'm not covering anything, I'm happy to do it at the end. So at least they know you're you're trying to connect with them. So what are the top three questions your audience has is a very simple way of not just assuming in your head, you know what they want, but actually and writing it down, you know, go and ask them or brainstorm it out with someone. Um, and sometimes it's very simple. You know what what's in it for me what can you do for me how does this work what does it cost i mean it can be again it doesn't have to be this crazy complicated thing it can be like if you were them what would you want to know and your first question is never going to be tell me the history about you and your company i mean that's just never going to be your first your first question is going to be what can you do for me or why pick you or or why am i in this room like what am i doing here 
you know, if you're a leader speaking to a, a company or a team, mostly people are sitting there going, what am I doing here? What is this about? And when can I go get my coffee break? I mean, it's as simple as that. And so tell them, <laughs> look, this is what we're here for. This is why it's important. And we'll have coffee in 15 minutes. Just tell them and meet them where they are. Not just starting where you think is right and kind of um, giving lots of information. It's not bad information. There's nothing wrong with it. But the audience is literally sitting there going, I don't even know why I'm supposed to listen to this. So if you do not connect at the beginning, back to our hook, if you don't connect, and you'll never understand what the hook is till you know who the audience is. Connecting with the audience, uh, Emma, if there's, there are many insights that you've shared in the book. If I had to choose one, I would choose this one. At some point you say that, I think this is super, super important. The, and it's connected to what we are talking about now, the audience. You say that the secret to great presenting is to always talk to your audience about them, even when you're talking about you, which is which is great. It's a great piece of advice. Again, can you tell us more about this? And and also, how can we do that in practice? Yeah. So it's it's talk to them about them, not at them about you. So I'll say that again. So 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 the trick, or well, it's not a, it's not a, I got it. The word trick actually, that's not even fair to say. We, we talk to them about them. We don't talk at them about you. And, and again, this is um, based on, I mean, before I wrote the presentation book, I was lucky enough to spend 10 years, eight, eight years, eight to 10 years working with amazing individuals, you know, who were struggling with all of the things that we're talking about. And actually, interestingly, not all struggling. Sometimes I met people and they were doing everything right. And I was like, wow. Oh, you're doing it and what are they doing that's that's so right as well because even as a, a trainer I remember initially going I'm not sure what I have to help people with you know media business are they even the same and then I would meet people and they'd be great and I'd be like oh my god they're doing everything right like <laughs> but they didn't necessarily know what they were doing right so we were just identifying so they could repeat and that was one of the things that came up a lot in 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 the, the years and the training I was doing with people um, they were talking at the audience kind of about themselves. And, and it goes back to that point about, I'm going to give you all of my data and I'm going to let you figure out what to do with it. And, and that's really where this audience focus presenting versus um, presenter focused presenting. So a very good presenter does all of the work for you. And if I could take it back to an even simpler example, and I, I hope you have one of these, I think we all do. If you go back to school and we had many, many teachers and we were learning, you know, not very sexy stuff. Well, maybe like geography and history. And, and there was always one, one teacher. In my case, it was he used to teach business, uh, commerce and business, accounting and business. It was not a sexy subject at all. Um, but he brought it to life. He, he just brought it to life and he talked, he used stories, he used examples and he told it how it related to us and he brought it to life for us. And he didn't talk about business and commerce, he talked about us and how it related to us. And he was always talking about it in relation to us and he used examples and stories and you know all, all of the techniques that we all talk about as communication sort of coaches. As opposed to, I had a history teacher who shall remain nameless, who literally, no joke, for an entire year, opened the history book, got his finger and just went like this nah, 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 for 45 minutes per class and just <laughs> and closed the book and we left. Now, again, did they both give us the information? They did. You know, could you say he didn't give us the stuff? He did. The history teacher did give us the information, but we had to do all of the work. We had to figure everything out for ourselves. You know, he made us work, whereas my my business and commerce teacher, it was just so easy. I, I, it was just so easy. He made it so easy and the amount of work he had to do to make it so easy. And I guess that's what I'm trying to sort of get across here is that 
brilliant, brilliant presenters. The reason they are so brilliant, and we know them when we see them, Andrea, don't we? We sit there and we watch them and we go, wow, my God, they are nailing it. And we say it's charisma and we say it's personality and we say it's this and we say it's that. And, and I'm not going to argue it's not part of that. And, you know, some people are very naturally charismatic and but that's not really what makes them brilliant. It certainly adds to it, of course. But what they are doing, these phenomenal presenters, is they're just making it so easy, so enjoyable. And they're taking the raw data and they're talking about it in a way that is so relatable, so easy, so relevant that I don't even have to think. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, wow, got it. Yeah, yeah. And it's, but the again, the amount of preparation and work that goes into doing that versus my history teacher with the, but it's the same as the slides. I mean, so many of us have had the experience of someone who puts up a slide deck, which is, which is a book and, and they just read it. And you're sitting there going, you know, dude, if that's all you were going to do, like, I could have done that myself. <laughs> I don't need to sit in a room with you if you're just going to read it. So, yeah, that's just the difference between talking to them about them as opposed to at them about the topic. If that and makes in the sense. Book, in the book, you give a practical technique, if you want. You say sometimes all you need to do is to use the word you. You is, is a very powerful word in communication. For example, I think... There's an example in your book. Now, Emma, I read it uh, maybe l last year or two years ago, but I think I remember there was an example like we have 58 offices all over the world. So this is about talking at them about, about you. Whereas if you say we have 58 offices all over the world so that you can get access to our customer support team wherever, wherever you are. So you... So it's about making, so this is talking to them about them, even when you're talking about yourself, yeah. which is great. Yes. And I, 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 it's very good memory. I can't believe you remember that. I would have had to open the book to remember that. Um, and again, this goes back to um, a lot of pitch presentations I would have done. And I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to your show. Um, as part of an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial pitch, obviously you're going to talk about yourself. <laughs> I mean, not just, I don't mean yourself. I mean, your what you're about and who you are and maybe your background and your history. And of course, some of that is going to come into it. And it's totally okay to talk about that, you know. But again, it's back to the linking back. You're going to lose an audience if, if you just go into a history of, no more than myself, if I sat here now for half an hour telling you every TV show I ever did, like it's only going to be interesting for 30 seconds, you know. But if I say to you, look, I did this live TV show and here was the big takeaway I got for you as a presenter. It's just linking. It's making that link back, especially if you're doing that part of the presentation where you're maybe talking about yourself, your team um, in that in that pitch presentation where you're talking about you and what you have to offer. It's just making sure you're those people you're listening to, those investors, really understand what that means for them. Yeah. And Emma, we are talking about the importance of making our presentations relevant to the audience, uh, starting with them. Now, sometimes, and uh, you do talk about in the book, sometimes we have mixed audiences. Yeah. So we've, we are there, we are presenting either in person or online, but the people we have who are listening to us, maybe they have a different level of understanding of a subject, they have a different level of education about it, a different level of knowledge about art, maybe different interests, different priorities. You give useful tips on how to approach that context when we need to present to mixed audiences. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Yeah. So that is a challenge. It's it's a huge challenge um, because everything begins with audience. And again, if you have, you know, one set of investors or one team sitting in front of you, great. <laughs> but what happens if you have, you know, you're at a big conference, which I'm sure many of your listeners uh, take part in, um, or you have rooms full of people at different places, different levels of knowledge. It's very, very, very challenging. And again, we're back to... I suppose, first of all, the reality is you cannot please everybody and you can't talk to everybody. So again, that's a fact. That's the first first thing. So 
then we're back to the first thing I would do in that situation. If, if I'm working with someone one to one or in a group, I'd say to them, OK, let's try and identify, well, firstly, what you're trying to achieve. And then within that room, can we identify, as I mentioned, the converted, the unconvertible and the floaters? Um, so so uh, to give an example of this, um, say you are a business leader communicating a, a change. So uh, you have people in the company a long time, 10, 15, 20 years, and you're introducing a whole new way of doing something. And you have to communicate this message to a big 100 people. So before you begin that presentation, you will have to acknowledge that, you know, there may be a small percentage of people in that room who they've been with the company a long time. No matter what you do or say, they're not going to buy into this new way of doing things. And actually, they're probably more likely to leave than they are to, you know, start doing this the new way. So you may possibly have a very small percentage of, of unconvertibles. Equally, you may have some people in the room, I don't know, there might be a handful of people that have already been involved in the training, they know what it's all about, they, you know, they're all on board with it. So then you're left with, again, what I call your floaters. So these are the people you need to get them converted. So within that group, you're going to have to look at the levels of knowledge. And, and the bottom line is, if you're unsure, you have to start right at the beginning. So if, if you're unsure, you have to go right back to basics. And again, I, I know this can be challenging, again, especially if you are an expert or, or if you've been involved in something for quite a few months, you know, for someone to say, well, actually, you're going to need to go right back and explain the acronym. And they're going to be like, like I do not need to explain the acronym. And you're like, but you do. Because there's going to be someone in that room that has never read the emails properly, that hasn't seen a presentation on it, that you think knows all about this, but actually wasn't even paying attention because they didn't even know what it had to do with them. So with a mixed audience, again, you need to identify your converted, your unconvertible and your floaters. And then within your floaters, you have to figure out the level of knowledge. But to be safe, what I would always say is start with the lowest level of knowledge, unless, and again, unless you decide um, and again, if I could try and give you an example, say you have inter in a room, a company, you have interns, graduates, associates, managers, and you decide, look, the interns and the graduates don't even know need to know about this grant. So if you're OK with people not getting it, not listening, not understanding, and you know you're going to start at a certain level, then that's OK. But I want you to consciously make that decision rather than go, oh, I'm sure they'll get it because they won't. So if in doubt, start at the beginning, the very beginning, right at the beginning, unless you are okay with people that don't have that level of knowledge not getting it. So it's an important decision that you need to work out again as part of your preparation. There are a couple of other questions I'd like to ask you before we approach the the conclusion of our, of our chat, Emma. One is, I found it funny, I found it interesting and there's an important message behind you. You say in your book that when you worked as a as a VJ or a DJ, maybe a radio host, I don't, don't remember now, but there was a sign in every studio that said, smile, everyone can hear you, not can see you. Smile because everyone can hear you. Uh, can you tell us what's what's the meaning of, of that sign? Yes. So that was my, uh, I, I had done quite a number of years in TV, and then I moved into radio and they're very, very different. And um, even live radio and live TV, they're very, very different. And with television, especially live television, there's a, a, I suppose, an energy just by means of there's an entire production crew and cameras and <laughs> your adrenaline is absolutely on fire. You know? uh, it just is because there's just so much going on. There's there's such a buzz. Radio is different. Uh, radio, you go into essentially a room by yourself. It's soundproofed, just again, by the nature of what radio is. You don't want noises from outside. It's usually quite a dark room and you're in it on your own. And there's no energy. <laughs> it's the complete opposite. And but yet you have to bring the same energy as you would nearly bring to a live TV show. But and you can go into um, radio in your pajamas because nobody can see you. And I have done radio practically, not quite, but practically in my pajamas. Uh, whereas obviously in TV, there's a whole thing. You have to look a certain way. 
So with radio, especially that that energy, that energy that you need behind your voice, that energy that you need behind your words, it's not always there. And um, I did early morning radio for a year or two, which was six o'clock in the morning. And believe you me, it's not always there. So it was actually in that job. There was a sign that somebody had put up and I'd never seen it before. Smile. Everybody can hear you. And it was true. Um, if if you were behind a microphone and people were listening to you, you sounded different when you smiled. Now you look insane, but you sounded <laughs> you're sitting in a studio doing this, but you did sound completely different. And again, the, the message there and the message I try to bring to people, and again, what I really learned from media that that again I I, I think people assume just comes automatically, was that you have to bring that energy. So I didn't wake up in the morning ready to present on radio and tv you know what i mean i didn't sort of arrive on set kind of you know excited to go and and i don't mean like a crazy cheerleader you know again i i think it's really really important i i don't you have to be authentic and you have to be yourself and i'm not asking you know a vp of accounting to start jumping around the room or you, you know it's nothing like that it's it's much more genuine and much more authentic than that but, but there is an energy Presenting is a performance, and I know that word can be scary and people can be allergic to that word or feel that's not part of who they are. But it is a performance. It is a performance. And there is an energy that is needed because you are trying to get a message across. You are trying to convert the floaters. You're trying to get a group of people to, to, to change their, their mind and change their state. And to do that, you must show up in a certain way. You must be up for it. Um, and that's what we used to say in TV. And like we used to, this was no joke. We used to have a soundtrack. We used to dance. I used to go into the toilet. I'm sharing too much now and jump up and down just because it was private. You would just go in and you'd be like jumping and you'd be just to get yourself ready. Um, and that was part of the smile. Everybody can hear you. You walk into that studio, you sit down and you're like, that's right. I have to be on. There is somebody at the other end of this microphone that I need to you know, perform for to a certain degree and be up for it for. And again, when it came to TV and media, this was part of our preparation. This was talked about. This was something that we that we did, you know, and, and it was planned into our our shows and I believe it's something that needs to be planned and is part of your your presentation and this is important because you don't have to to work as a as a DJ or a radio host today if we think about online communication which for obvious reasons is more and more relevant we are here I mean I'm at home with my home studio I'm giving a webinar and and it's the the, the context is is very similar so smile everyone can hear you I love that uh, Emma, are there, if we think, if you think about everything we've talked about today, beyond the presentation book, which I strongly recommend to all of our listeners, beyond your own resources, is there another book or books? Are there any other books that you would recommend to our listeners? So, um, I think you already mentioned presentations. Then I'm a I'm a huge huge fan of Gar. And yesterday, um, I don't know if you know Emma. Sorry to cut you off. <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> Yesterday, we we hosted an event with Gar as a guest speaker. It, it was oh, great. I oh, he's I, I've Presentation Zen was one of the first books that I that I ever read when I moved into this space. Because um, as I said, I sort of brought my media very hands on experience, but um, I didn't have all the language, you know, and, and um, Presentation Zen. I know it's in its I'm going to say third edition now. Third, it's yeah. Third, third. Yeah. Um, I, I rate Gar and, and everything he does. Um, and Nancy Duarte, I would be very influenced. And I would, again, it's like we talk, certainly a lot of what she does resonates with me and resonate is her book. That was by accident. I didn't mean to do that. But um, again, look, presentation coaches are different. And there's many coaches that focus more on, say, the body language and the other pieces, which are very important as well. But I suppose for, for, for the work I do, I'm very focused on that messaging and the communication and that piece and Nancy would be, or Duarte, I mean, it's a whole organization now, would be very, very similar. And I've used their resources. I've read their books. I just love um, what they do and she does. So for, for me, they would be two resources. Talk Like Ted, you mentioned that there's, I mean, there's some super books. 
um, out there. And I mean, the principles are quite similar in terms of communication. So it's it's just about getting them across and using them in a way that business leaders are able to digest them and, and put them into practice. Yeah, we're going to include them in the in the show notes. Yeah, Gar Reynolds. Also for me, um, my passion for presentations, public speaking started when I was at university and I read this amazing book, Presentation Zen. And that's why yesterday I was super excited to to host this event with him as a guest speaker. Nancy Duarte, uh, yeah, Resonate, uh, Recently Data Story, Slide Theology from a presentation design perspective. Um, I, I read another one as well, maybe, which I don't remember now. But yeah, I'm, we are going to include the links. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask you, because this is a question that I ask authors. So you brought the book uh, and others as well. But if you if you think about the presentation book in particular, let's say that you could go back and change something or add something or change anything to the book. Would you do it? Is there anything that you would change or add or improve? It's a great question. And actually, this is the the the, the book, uh, the, the yellow book is the second edition. So the first edition was a blue book. And that's exactly what happened. I wrote it and I was still learning. I'm, I'm still learning now. And I, I think for me, the first book was a little bit more a stick than carrot. I, I felt in the in the first book I was I was um, I was giving out a bit more, but I was like, you're terrible and you should, you know. And then as I worked a little bit more with people and as I grew, I realized, no, you know what? That's everybody really is out there trying so hard. And what they need is is a very simple how and what they need is whether they have 10 minutes or 10 hours, you know, they need a solution. They, they don't need to be told they're doing something wrong. And, I, and in the first book, I felt maybe I focused a little bit more on the problem. Whereas I feel in the newer edition, I'm much more, at least I hope, I'm much more solution focused. Um, because again, I, I, I feel it's, 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 it's the way to go, you know, the carrot rather than the, rather than, I went, first book was more the fear, second edition is more the benefit. Um, but yes, I do have a chapter in there about virtual presenting, but I think it's interesting, um, as you say, everyone, everyone is presenting now. Look at this. I mean, everyone, everyone. But that also means I think we're being compared at a much higher standard. So um, what I would love to maybe do with the next edition or indeed with another book, I would love to maybe look at some of the. I know it's a little bit subjective and objective, but I would love to maybe take. 10, 12, you know, very successful presenters and look at what they're doing and how they're doing it. And the other thing I would I would love to do is, uh, and this is maybe an important point to, to finish on. Um, I meet a lot of people that think presenting should be comfortable and they use that word a lot. I want to be more comfortable. And I think this is really important because in all the years that I have been doing this, including today, like I was nervous about today. <laughs> me too, Emma, me yeah, too. Yeah, right? I was I was nervous. I was nervous about the technology. I was nervous about how I looked. I was nervous about what you'd ask me. I was nervous. No, I was excited. And I was so looking forward to it. And I will be buzzing, buzzing for the day, Andrea. I was nervous. And, and I have always been nervous. And there's never been a time I haven't been nervous. Now, sometimes those nerves are at the point of crippling and sometimes they're just a butterfly in my tummy but I'm always nervous and I don't think it should ever be a goal to be to be comfortable because I believe if you're too comfortable you maybe don't care enough or you're not aware enough of, of everything so I, I think that's important and that's maybe something down the road to explore not with me but I would love to talk to very seasoned presenters out there you know, your Jacinda Ardens, your Michelle Obamas, and sort of say to them, you know, let's talk about how you get nervous and how you control that. Because it, it, it's a physiological response. It happens to all of us. You know, it's not, there's nothing wrong with you. But that goal of I want to be comfortable, it, it, for me, that's the wrong thing to focus on because you're not supposed to feel comfortable. You know, you're supposed to feel heightened. Now you need to manage that and that's tricky. But yeah, I think it would be very interesting to talk to people who are out there every day doing this and how they channel that like a professional sports 
person because people believe there's a myth out there. Oh, your man just stood up and he was never nervous. And, and it's just not true. Yeah. Right. Uh, you're right. Presenting is not a comfortable thing to do. Presenting is not a natural thing to do. And, and also thank you for your transparency, for your approach. I've noticed your approach. You mentioned the difference between uh, edition one and edition two of your book. I noticed your approach, even in this conversation, you, you approach things and you communicate things from the perspective of someone who, of course, knows a lot about what you're talking about, but also I, I see that you see yourself as a student of great communication, which I totally appreciate. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And it's always changing. I mean, look, look what COVID has done. Zoom and... I also think now, and maybe that's something else to include, you know, diversity, diverse language. You know, the world is, as, as if we go full circle back to my children's book, you know, the world is changing. And not only do our little people have to figure that out, and hopefully they'll figure it much quicker than we all have. We need to figure that out, you know, communicating around different cultures and, um, yeah, just the way we all perceive things and take things on board. It's, it's, you know, the world is yeah. getting smaller. And on that point for our listeners, some time ago uh, for this podcast, I interviewed Jackie Handy on diversity in communication. Brilliant. So check it out. There's also an episode with Steffi Hogan. And there we talked about accept designing. So it was about slide design, but designing accessible presentations. So We've got important. two episodes there. And Emma, for those who would like to connect with you, where where do they find you? Where should they go? Yes. So um, LinkedIn, I would, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, actually, I'm, I'm Emma Ledden and I'm, McGovern is my married name. So just you, you should see me. I, I, I don't know if I look that much different, but it's Emma Ledden McGovern there. Uh, the hobbies that I have to put it on or I'll be in big trouble. I'm just joking. And it's Emma Ledden McGovern. Um, I'm also on Instagram, but I, I don't do a huge amount on there yet. And I'm going to venture onto TikTok, but I haven't, oh, I haven't gotten that far. I just don't know if I can do dancing yet. But um, yes, I'm hoping in the future to turn the presentation book into a course and kind of venture a little bit further into that world. So LinkedIn would probably be the uh, most effective way to connect with me at, at this stage. And again, we are going to include the link. Please do in include the, the link. Yes. In the show notes, Emma. My, here is my last question. Let's say that somebody listens to to this conversation uh, on audio. Maybe they watch the the video version, and it could be you never know. We talked about audiences' interest and attention. Let's say that then after a while they forget everything. It, it could be now they forget everything apart from one thing. They just remember one thing. And if they remember that thing, then you would be happy. Yeah. Of all of the things we talked about, what's the one thing you would like our listeners to take away from this conversation? Uh, it's, that, it's the what's in it for me piece. It's, it's that the presentation is, is not about you. It really is about your listeners. So if you can just remove yourself, because you're never, you are never, ever, ever going to be at the right place to start your presentation. You're all, you are the converted. You are always going to be the converted and you're trying to get back to that floater space. So if you can just ask that question, be that audience member sitting there, wondering when coffee is going, what is this? What is in this for me? Why should I even listen to this girl? Like for God's sake, so what like? If you can just go back to that mindset and answer that question, what is in it for me? Why should I listen? If you could just do that and nothing else, it will transform your presentations. And I know I said I don't do one, but I'll do two because look at all your existing presentations, go to the very end and flip them and you'll probably have the best presentation in the whole world. <laughs> lead, with your, lead with your strongest point. Lead and and the strongest. first one, I like I, I said that yesterday we've done this event with Gar. I've also interviewed Gar for the podcast and yes. he told me a similar thing. He said two two key questions. What's your point and why should I care? What's your point? Why should I care? 
Emma, thank you so much. I wanted to tell you, if you ever come to London, please let me know. I would love to to meet up in person. That would be nice. And if I come to Dublin, I'll, I'll let you know. And um, thank you very much again for this conversation. I'm looking at the time here. This has been the longest conversation for the podcast. But it's for me, it's it's good. I'm not interested. I know that if we think about audiences, attention spans, I should try and keep things shorter, but I don't care. I just like to have a nice conversation. And for me, it was very enjoyable, very useful. And I know that it's been the same. And I hope that it's been the same for our for our audiences. So thank you very much. All the very best. Yeah. And uh, let's keep in touch. Well, Joe, thank you so much. And I'll, I'll take you up on that when I come to London. And yes, I, oh my, I, I, I'm telling everybody to be short and sweet and to the point. But when you get me started talking, <laughs> presenting, I can't stop. I get so excited. But um, I've, I've, I'm so glad it was worth the wait, Andrea. It really was. And I, I really, really hope that um, your listeners enjoy listening as much as I've enjoyed talking to you. And uh, feel free to edit as much as you need i'm not Look, i'll tell you i'll tell you already i'm not going to edit anything because the reason why it was longer it wasn't because of you it was because you were sharing so many important ideas and insights that i felt let's let's continue so th there won't be any any editing thank you very much again emma thank you andrea absolutely take care if you enjoyed this episode of the Ideas on Stage podcast, there are many more you might like, so please subscribe, leave us a review, and tell us what you think. You can find many more ideas on business communication at ideasonstage.com or by searching for Ideas on Stage on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and goodbye for now.